Welcome to Drinking Bros, presented by GhostBed.com. Welcome to Drinking Bros, kids. We are, man, 10 hours away from the state of Texas reopening. All of us bear facers will be out into the world. Uh, we are celebrating a little heavily. T- You're drinking Black Rifle? Uh, yeah, it is uh, an RTD uh, coffee drink with 300 milligrams of caffeine. So it's like two shots of espresso. Basically. My God, man. They're in every store there is, right? Uh, they are now, yeah. Good for uh, them. Look at that. It's good. They also have, so if you get the Starbucks version of this, um, it is, I think, 38 grams of sugar. And somehow they got it down to 17. I'm, I don't know if I believe this or not. Well, I'm, I'm, we're, 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 so we're making a seltzer, and that's what we're working on as, as well, and getting that down. Thing, yeah. yeah, so I understand it, and oddly enough, I know the back end of that, but it's all kind of a big bluff with everything uh, that goes on, and it's smoke and mirrors uh, with all of it, and we have the author of uh, the biggest bluff on the show today, Maria Konnikova. How are you? I'm doing well. How are you guys? How many times do you get confused for... Anna Kornikova? Yes, all the time and you know i don't mind because obviously she's talented attractive you know Mm. great great to be confused with her but what i don't get is when people say they're fans of my book and then they quote me and they say by anna konnikova (laughs) like guys come on (laughs) it's right in front of you i think it's one of those subliminal things like uh what was the shazam movie um there was a a whole thing on the internet for it uh there was a theory about it, how you're calling it the wrong name every single time you, you think it happened. Oh, the Mandela effect? That's it. Yes. I think it's like that. I think it's like the Mandela effect where it's like you have an unusual last name that you don't see that much. Therefore, you've only heard it one time from a famous tennis player and you associate it and you're like, oh, all right. Well, great. That must be the same. No, it's not. It's not the same person. Nope. It's not close. even the same last name. No. It's not at all. And you, look, and you, you don't even play tennis so far as I can tell. I mean, I don't see any tennis rackets. I do rackets. not play tennis. No, so. At all? No, I mean, I used to play when I was a kid because I'm Russian and, you know, we do that. Um, But uh, yeah, you do. It's mostly tennis and cold soups over there. Yeah, a lot of potatoes. And And chess. chess, Yeah. And chess. But I sucked at chess and quit (laughs) after one week. Um, I was a little better at tennis, but never very good. Yeah. What did you think of the Queen's Gambit? Did you watch it? I did. Um, You know, it's funny. I really enjoyed watching it and I had issues with a lot of different elements of the show but it was such an enjoyable watching experience overall that i can't criticize yeah, you know, yeah. They, they they it all came together so well it was weird like all of us were locked into this thing uh, yeah. as we all have been throughout covid right i feel like there was moments that were bookmarked uh by i mean specifically netflix shows um you know tiger king started off the pandemic it well, sure we, did. Yeah. I did not watch that one. Yeah, okay. But but I but for all of the rest of us, right? Yes. The, the first yes. day of lockdown, it came out that day. And so everybody got caught up in that. And it was a, a worldwide phenomenon. Right after that, it was uh, The Last Dance, that doc with Michael Jordan. Yeah. We were all sucked into that. We knew where we were. Uh, and then towards the end of it was The Queen's Gambit, where we're like, dude, we're sick of a- everything. What is this with a female chess player? I mean, it sucked in dudes, uh, you know, which is tough to do. Um, chess is already difficult because that script had been around in Hollywood for like 15 years. And yeah. and, and then putting a, a female lead in it who's playing uh, against Russia like uh, was like, huh? Well, yeah, we're all in. And I, I enjoyed the shit out of it. So did I. So yeah. did I. And she did such an amazing job. What a great actress. Yeah, she's great. Um, yeah, I like those stories. Uh, uh, I mean, how many, I guess more people know who Mary Curie is now, right, than probably 10 years ago. Yeah, luckily. I'm sure, yes. Uh, but I doubt many people know that Hedy Lamar designed the fucking uh, the general logic behind frequency hopping radios, GPS, the internet at large. Yeah. Wrote it on the back of a cocktail napkin, and people were like, hey, look, you know, you look great in a dress, but why don't you shut up, honey? Yeah, and, yeah, 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 yeah. And it stunted our growth technologically for about 25 years. <laughs> yeah. Because, yep. because of dude. I, yeah. I guess yeah. I don't know what the <laughs> fuck you call that. But I like those stories. I like the story of. Uh, uh, I can't remember the woman's name, and this fucking proves my point, that worked with uh, Alan Turing on the computer, mm-hmm. the original computer. Right? I can't yep. remember her goddamn name. Uh, but Yep, well, we have Ada Lovelace. Yeah, Ada Lovelace well. is another one, yeah. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's interesting to me, yeah. those things. And like, uh, if you watch the HBO series John Adams, mm-hmm. and it's, it's about John Adams' perspective about the birth of the country, uh, his wife was like his closest confidant, one of the s- smartest women of all time, had it, played a huge role in the formation of this country. 
and nobody knows who the fuck she is, right? Right. It's very bizarre. Yeah. Like, what, how? I just don't understand. It's, don't it's it. the stories you choose to tell and why and from what perspective and whatever slant you're going to put on them. That's why I'm always talking about that book, The Master Switch by Tim Wu. The per, yeah. the, who, like, we, we have this uh, idea from the past. There's a ladybug right there. Yeah. We have this idea from the past that uh, the, the winner gets to rewrite the history book every time. And in ancient Chinese culture, that was absolutely true. Each new uh, uh, emperor that came in pretty much wiped out the old shit and wrote their own history. So we've lost a lot in translation there. Luckily, the Japanese kept good records. But uh, now it's more of you don't have to wait until your the your opponent is gone. You could just take control of of media, right? And, yeah. and decide who gets to hear what. And it's not new. We 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 like to think like, oh, the liberal media is doing this and that now. No, it's been going on since media has existed. Yeah, for 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 a very long time, yeah. and no one would know that better than you. I mean, yeah. you started off your career. Uh, what at the, were you at the New Yorker? I was. I didn't start off my career at the New Yorker. It took me a while to get to the New Yorker. Oh, was it? Was it like a million other jobs that like nobody talks about in a bio, and then they're like, ah, the New Yorker sounds like a good one to lead off my my uh, resume with? Indeed, indeed. I did a lot of freelance work and was a columnist at Scientific American for a while, um, and was rejected by the New Yorker for many years before I joined them as a writer. Really? What's yeah, the, what's the process like for that? Yeah. Um, for being rejected? Well, yeah, yeah, first because you write it, a piece and you spend a lot of time on it and mm -hmm. you research it and you put your heart into it. Then you submit it to an editor and you get a nice little one sentence note back mm -hmm. saying, thank you very much, but this isn't for us. And it's signed. And then you try again and again and again. And meantime, you're publishing these pieces elsewhere mm -hmm. because I was always able to put them somewhere else. And then eventually someone says, oh, this seems like a good idea. Um, and then you have your first byline in the New Yorker. And if it goes well, you keep getting more bylines and eventually they give you a contract. Now, the reason I ask this is this is one of the most, uh, I guess, interested questions that our audience always sends in of, hey, I wanna be a writer. My daughter wants to be a writer. My son wants to be a writer. You're a writer. How do we do it? How do we go from there? I only did screenplays in books. I don't mm -hmm. know. The, the magazine side of it, um, do you have to send in essentially like a query letty, like a query, a query letter, like a book, or does your agent submit for you? No, I mean, I, I think everyone works a little bit differently, but I personally and all of my writer friends do not work with an agent when it comes to submitting ma for magazines and newspapers, but you do have to pitch. So you, you send a pitch, you say, you know, this is my story idea. Um, this is why it's important and timely. This is why I'm the right person to tell it, um, you know, wh whatever it is. Um, and then you hope that you're going to hear back. And at the beginning, you do a lot of cold pitching, a lot of which is the same as cold calling, right? Mm -hmm. You just send, find contact information and try to try to get things out there. Um, and eventually, once you have a name and a reputation and you've been writing editors will start to know you and will reach out to you um, and will say, hey, you know, the story seems like a good fit for you. Are you interested? Um, and that's kind of the goal to get to that point, uh, that part of your career. Yeah, it is. And then, you know, starting with the New Yorker like that. Look, I lived in New York, uh, went to NYU after Ohio State. It, it is a very prestigious magazine. Every rich household on the Upper East Side that I went to for some party or to date some girl, <laughs> they had a copy of The New Yorker on their coffee table. It was one of those things in New York in particular where yeah. it, it showed a, a level of wealth. If you had The New Yorker, you were smart, you were well-read, and you were able to have a conversation about things that people don't typically have conversations about. Um, once you're there at the New Yorker going through all of that, mm -hmm. do you really get to say what you want to say and write the pieces you want to write? Or do they pick out pieces for you and say, no, you're going to say this with this type of narrative? You know, it really depends on who you are and how you write. I always had a lot of my own ideas and I never actually, I never worked on a piece um, that was assigned to me, but that's quite rare. So I would always um, it's very rare. pitch a bunch of my own ideas and write what I wanted to write about. And so I was very lucky that I was able to do that. And they definitely don't censor in the sense of, oh, this is how you're going to write it. I think even if they assign a story to you, they're going to, 
assign the topic. They're not going to say, this is how you write it. That's what you work on with the writer and the editor. You mean, but, you mean at the New Yorker specifically or in media? Because that's certainly not true with the Washington Post. There's been plenty of articles over the last year or so where they, their executive board has clearly directed people to get away from certain talking points and promote certain talking points. Same with the New York Times. Yeah, same with the New York Times. I've never been at either of those institutions, yeah. so I can't comment. But at the New Yorker, it's never been like that. But it's a magazine. It's right. It's yeah. not a newspaper. It's a, it's a different thing. Um, the, the New Yorker does seem a little cut above those. I mean, I, to me, the, the, the print media from the past, the print newspaper media that's converted into digital media at this point, those are all rags. I don't pay any attention to that shit anymore, to be honest. The New Yorker helps has historically held itself a little higher in esteem yeah. and that doesn't fuck around and dumb shit like that in my experience anyways like i don't read every single article obviously but they don't seem to get caught up in so much of that nonsense which is nice because there's not a whole lot of that going around i mean i can't go to the washington post or fox news and get real information you know what i mean yeah, yeah, yeah. i have to i have to like pour it in through this filter and shake it and be like, all right, here are the actual facts and now what the fuck's going on. You know what yeah, I mean? is that why you didn't want to write for like a Washington Post or a New York Times? Um, no, it's more my sensibility. I like longer pieces. I like mm. to be able to live with a topic. And so my ideal writing length is book. Right. You know, I actually like um, The Biggest Bluff was my third book mm -hmm. um, and I like doing that the best. Um, and that's kind of when I get to live in a world for years, right, that's yeah. my ideal. And well, you've come along at a great time then with that attitude because long form content is king right now. And, right? and in particular, yeah. audiobooks. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. 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 For sure. Well, I narrated my own audiobook for for this book and for the book before. This one I wanted to do myself in particular because it's memoir. Right. Um, but uh, the prior one I did as well. And I'm actually working on an Audible original right now. So Sweet. I'm definitely, yeah. definitely yeah, you've, big you've into the audio own, space. Right? You've you've beat, you beat me to the, the question there on that you've one. You've got to read your I, own. Yes, yes. Unless you, I've unless been you're this a, for years. I, don't, I can't think of any examples right now unless you sound like uh, Andy Coffin doing his weird little character on Taxi. Uh -huh. Unless you have a weird ass voice. Read your own fucking audio book, for Christ's sake. Yes. I want to yes. hear it from your, like, Matthew McConaughey's book. We had him on two months mm -hmm. ago, Green Lights. is an amazing book in its own right. So much more amazing that I get to hear him read it to me. It's like I, I tuck myself in at night, and I pull the covers all the way up <laughs> yep. to my chin. Yep. Only my hands are exposed, and I'm like this. Ah, I'm really comfy. I've got uh, some hot chocolate right there. Yep. And I'm listening to Matthew McConaughey with that silky southern accent. Yeah. You know, yeah. rock hey, me to sleep. There I was, man in a van. Down rock the me river. to sleep. It's great. And yeah. Neil deGrasse Tyson, too, his book. Now, he had some sections where uh, uh, a female, in the, his reason, if we ask him about it, his reason was, I don't want to take those jobs away from people. It makes sense to me. But come on, Neil, we want to hear you talk. Buddy. Yes, we want to hear you talk. Yeah. But it is a high paying gig if you it are is, yeah. doing it um, yep. on your own. It's not, it's not high paying if you do it for your own. No, money. it's no, not. No, not for it's your zero own. pay. But, <laughs> but if, if, someone, if, if the publisher is paying for that other person, when I looked at the quote for that guy, I was like, oh, holy yeah. shit. Can, you, no, imagine, can no. you imagine going to the publisher and be like, hey, if you're going to pay him that, I'll do it for half that. They're like, no, fuck face. <laughs> yeah, that's yeah. your buck. Yes. Get yes. the fuck out of here. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, which is crazy. So, you know, somebody like you, uh, and I hope you don't take offense to this you seem no. so unassuming and nice and all that stuff um the book's about poker and you being a poker yeah. player well the book is not about <laughs> poker it's about it's about uh, uh sociology right it's it about is yes human beings well, and how they but that's what life is right yeah. it's it's yeah a, it's, it's a giant poker, poker as life metaphor yes yeah. it is a giant <laughs> game of poker this whole life yeah. is and i i just did a sh i literally just did a show about this where it's all smoke and mirrors it's all a card tricks and everything else and it's like the, the world has become one big poker game where oh, everybody's sure. kind of against each other and all these facets and you don't know who's telling lies or truths or why or whatever. And then someone has the winning hand. Typically it's not the little guy, it's the richest or whatever. Um, <laughs> and that's what your book is about essentially. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so it's funny. We started off with the queen's gambit and in some ways my book is kind of the poker version, but it's real. It's not fiction. So I went from New Yorker writer who'd never played poker, um, who didn't, you know, wasn't a fan of the game, didn't watch the game. I literally did not know how many cards were in a card deck um, and decided to leave the New Yorker get one of the best players in the world to coach me and see what I could learn and ended up going pro, um, winning an international championship, becoming sponsored by poker stars. Like it ended up becoming an entirely new life for a number of years. And that's not something I could have anticipated and was, um, 
the reason why the book was delayed by a few years. <laughs> it was supposed to be out a few years back. Oh, was it really? Yeah, well, it was originally I was going to do this for one year, right? I was going to go on leave and um, learn the game and play in the World Series main event and write about it and write about what I'd learned along the way. But one of the things that I started learning was that I wasn't ready to leave. I wasn't ready to um, start writing about it because I was living it. And I was, I ended up falling in love with the game because it was so much more complex and beautiful, so much better of a metaphor for life than I could have ever imagined ahead of time because I didn't know anything about it. Um, and to be honest, it up, up probably helped that um, it ended up that I was good at it yeah, and was yeah, making yeah. more money than I made from writing. You get a little so. street cred from that too. Do you think, uh, I mean, to me, this this sounds like gonzo journalism without the drugs, right? Yeah, uh, yes. Unless so, you did take drugs. Did well, you take I, mean, drugs? Yeah. I did not, but there are, and that's just me. I don't mm-hmm. like to fuck with my brain um but it's actually really big on the poker circuit especially i don't know if especially but certainly with the best players they Mm -hmm. all try to mind hack and optimize and there's a section in my book that people have asked like did this really happen and the answer is yes when i had made a final table and i couldn't sleep and i ran into this group of really great players Mm -hmm. high rollers everyone would know all their names and each one of them offered me like their own personal drug of choice for those types of situations and i was like wow you guys are just well calibrated and i say this with the utmost respect like they do the research they read Mm -hmm. they figure out kind of which substance to use when and what quantity um it's not for me, but I, I respect it. You no, just I, described I Dan's entire life. Yeah, yeah. I, I hack all the time. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, but, but I don't real. want to church it up. I mean, I You're do, never though. irresponsible. No. Everything is measured. Everything mm. you do is measured. I've never yeah. seen you do drugs on a level that it's like, oh, well, Dan's out of control. No, I mean, I, 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 it's, life is about purpose, right? If you're doing something with purpose, then you automatically build in uh, schema to understand it and left and right limits in which to operate. That's just how life works. Right. And right. I mean, but you can't, that, the problem with a lot of these guys, uh, uh, Rogan's pretty good about curtailing some of this horse shit, but some of these people that are proponents of, uh, hedonism like this or a hedonic calendar, uh, overlook the fact that the vast majority of people don't have the discipline to do what you're yeah. doing. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Yep. And it's irresponsible just to say that shit out loud. Correct. In my opinion, yep. uh, without also saying, Hey, look, here are some of the pitfalls and blah, blah, blah. Don't know your know. limits. Yeah. Um, uh, exactly. And, and with poker, uh, now I dabbled in it a little bit, right? Just a tad. When it started to get hot, there was some friends of mine, because we've all got friends who are, I'm a great poker player and I win my neighborhood <laughs> tournament and blah, 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 right? And then they think, great, man, I'm going to go to Vegas and sit in one of those rooms uh, at the Bellagio where there's 80 tables and uh, I'm going to go all in against these guys and I'm going to beat them because I beat everybody from my neighborhood and then they get absolutely fucking smashed, right? I sat there for one night and, and did the just one night of it, more or less for me out of curiosity. Yeah. Um, I'm sure it was probably like your opening nights and uh, I lost my ass, um, but it was very slow, very methodical um, and all of these, <laughs> so I, I won the first hand by bluffing um, and- uh, uh, Well they, done. Well, thank you. But that turned out to be my downfall um, when I, Flip the cards over to the dealer. It the one of the, the cards hit a corner of a chip and then turned. Uh, so they saw. Ugh. Yeah, and I didn't. Gotta know. be careful. Yes, <sighs> and the other part about it is I can operate on a lot of alcohol. So we were all drinking that night, and uh, one by one, it was like a slow nod where they looked at each other around the table, and over the course of three hours, they proceeded to take every yeah, last there's an old, dollar there's from an old me quote at that about, table. There's an old quote about that. If you're sitting at a table and you don't know who the sucker is, you're it. Correct. Right. And I was definitely the sucker. Yeah. How were you not on your first attempt out, or did you get the professional coach before going into it? Um, I did get the professional coach before going into it, but I was still a total sucker. I mean, it took me a while to start winning and, but I was a little bit more prepared. So I didn't go into my first live game, um, completely just fresh with no knowledge of anything. So we had a kind of a lesson plan. So first you see all these books. So first we did a lot of reading Mm -hmm. and Eric Seidel, who was my coach, assigned me kind of books to read and 
to figure out what the game was because I didn't know anything. And watching videos, I signed up for training sites. Then he made me start playing online. So I live in New York, but I actually reverse commuted to New Jersey every day because online poker is legal in New Jersey and played online so that I could get in hands, you know, hundreds and thousands of hands in a much faster way than I ever would live. And until I won my first online tournament. So I play tournament poker, mm -hmm. mostly not cash. And that's what I focused on. Now I play both, but at the beginning, I really focused on tournaments. So until I won my first tournament and started consistently winning and built up my bankroll, he didn't allow me to play live. So once I had uh... a few thousand dollars bankroll just for poker, because he wanted me to take this seriously and really approach it like a professional mm -hmm. would. Sure. Then I was allowed to go to Vegas and only play in small tournaments, you know, like the $30 daily tournaments, not the $100 tournaments that I wanted to play. Mm -hmm. He's like, no, 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 that's way too much money yeah. <laughs> because you're going to be firing a lot of these and not cashing. And that's, that's exactly lesson, what though, happened. Right? That's oh, a good, it's a hu it's huge lesson, for like, bankroll management. Yeah, for startups, th this is a lesson in business. If you read the book Traction or if you read Principles mm -hmm. by Ray Dalio or any of these books, uh, they will tell pretty much anybody that's had success in investing as an AC or VC or whatever it is will tell you that if you have too much money in the beginning, you spend your way out of mistakes and you don't learn lessons and you, you're fucked downstream, right? Right, right. So you went through the process the right way. And this is the problem, right, with modern culture. We want everything now, but the things yeah. don't work that way. So no. the, the, if you are the, uh, the bellwether of resurgent gonzo journalism trend, that would be really good for this country, frankly. It'd be good for, for humanity in general, but certainly <laughs> for this country who we, we've... It seems like we're getting a little bit of our patience back because everybody's figured out that most of our leaders and the media are full of shit, right? And it's not even, it's not even always that they're full of shit. It's that they, they're trying to distill a massive amount of information down to uh, the lowest common denominator. Which is a headline. Yeah. Yeah. It's yeah. A, it's a, it's, yep. And it turns into clickbait when you add product, profit motive to it. It is a, it's, it's a completely, uh, uh, the system itself intrinsically is, is almost predatory. You know what I mean? So it's a difficult job. I don't, I don't want to sh completely shit on people for it, but now it seems like long form content is coming back. People have more of an appetite yeah. for it. Even yeah. if it's a 10 part Netflix series that you're going to binge watch over the course of two days, <laughs> or if it's a fucking three hour podcast or whatever the case is. Or, or right? the documentary is the only thing I will say of like, Hey man, that could have been like as a, <laughs> as a director, I'm like, Hey man, that could have been conduced to like two hours. I didn't need the seven part series where the other four parts sucked. Uh, like Nexium, for example, on HBO. Whatever, man. I could have figured out that that homeboy was carving initials in a her by episode too. Like that, we're good on that. Uh, but for you, that's a, that's that is a great point. Um, mm -hmm. We host a huge sports show as well, and uh, and we gamble on it. Sports gambling mm -hmm. uh, across the United States has taken off. Um, it has. Uh, the reason why, like, I know why you had to go to New Jersey is, you know, when you're online, certain states have certain online capabilities for different gambling. We're mm -hmm. going through that now with sports gambling, where mm -hmm. betting on live games, I think you can only do it in six states right now. However, the Supreme Court has approved it for all 50. It will get there eventually, but it's up to each state's regulations and, and rules and when they're going to pass that and allow it. Um, but knowing that, I'm surprised that you didn't go to like AC or something like that. Um, were they not no. doing it in Atlantic City? No, no, they were. I mean, they were playing live poker, but um, my coach, Eric, is um, from um, Vegas. Mm -hmm. And so that's kind of his home base. And there are many more games going on in Vegas than in AC. AC is right. yeah, 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 yeah. Um, yeah. And so I just relocated to Vegas for a few months um, so that I could play every single day and get volume in. Yeah. Um, so that was the and I've played in AC since then. So yeah. it's it's not like it's not like I rejected i think it's mm. wonderful the borgata has great tournaments um but for kind of this initial learning experience it was better to be somewhere where there's basically a tournament going on anytime day or night any day of the week literally um, literally like yes, you can literally I mean, you can literally. find one at three in the morning you can find yes. one at six at night noon lunchtime. Yep, there's one yeah. yep there's one that starts at 9 a.m yeah. for the people who never went to sleep or the ones like me who are you know journalists and wake up and say "Ooh, 9 a.m let's go play a tournament but i ended up being in vegas for like the first month i did not i couldn't cash for the life of me and it was felt like all of the studying i was doing all of these things i was learning like it was 
pointless because I just kept busting. And for people who don't know what tournament poker is like, it's not like a cash game. You pay your entry fee, but then most people go home with zero. Yeah. It's not like you can get up at any point in time and cash out. Your chips have no cash value. So normally about anywhere from 10 to 15% of the field get paid and everyone else makes zero. And so those $30 tournaments were adding up really quickly. And I was like down a grand. I was like, holy shit, what is even happening? And I came very close a few times called bubbling. When you uh, bubble a tournament, it means that you're the last person to get zero and the next person who is out actually makes money but i still remember my first uh, tournament cash i won a planet hollywood tournament for a little over nine hundred dollars and oh. it was like the greatest moment i thought you were gonna life. say a planet hollywood t-shirt i'm like fuck yeah no. yeah you yeah. can't even find those goddamn things anymore did you stay in the planet hollywood <laughs> no no um i actually <laughs> stayed at the aria which is where eric played mm. oh okay that's what the, uh the aria hosts all the high rollers yeah, yeah. um and so they are very nice to poker players. That's yeah. great. Well, at any point, did you consider quitting? Because after you keep yeah. losing enough, and this is what happened to some friends of mine, I have a little bit of knowledge into that poker world. Again, the ones who thought they were really good and flying out to Vegas all the time to go to the tournaments and everything else, finally, you know, three, four months in, they realized I'm not good enough for this and I am just a neighborhood poker player who is probably better than all my friends, but not even close to this professional level. Um, was there a, a moment where you were like, I'm gonna quit and just get the fuck out of here? There were definitely times when I came close to quitting. And the reason I didn't was because as you keep calling it, it was gonzo journalism. And there was a little third person me sitting on my shoulder saying, hey, you know, it doesn't matter if you're winning or losing, this is good material. You're learning really important lessons for life. And I was really lucky because Eric stressed to me that it's never about the outcome as long as you're thinking well. Right? It's not about whether you won or you lost, it's about did I think through this correctly? Did I make the right decision? Um, and if the answer is yes, keep going and eventually you'll start winning. Um, and so that was very helpful. But I think the moments that I came closest to quitting, it wasn't just because I was losing. It's also because um, it's tough when 98% of the world is male and you're the only woman at the table. And a lot of times guys aren't used to playing with females. And I definitely um, had had to go through a little bit of abuse um, at the poker table. You, when you yeah. say abuse, what do you mean? And part two um, of that. I've been called, oh. I've been called everything. I mean, every word you can think of, you know, bitch, cunt, mm. whatever. I've been called to my face, right. especially when I'm winning. Actually, that started happening more when I started taking people's money. <laughs> yeah. But, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. but, are but the that guys, happened. The guys are not I, speaking to one another that way, you think? No, no, not at all. Because I, um, I call everybody cunts. I, I actually, <laughs> I pause when I, before I call a woman one. Because it seems weird to me, but dudes, I call console. Oh, it's time. Oh, it's time. Yeah. Yeah. No, this is this was directed at me. Um, I've been propositioned at a poker table, like actually given a room key and told what my rate would be. Um, you know, like was kind it of high. Out. Was it a good number? Well, it was a it was a five k tournament, and the guy told me not to worry about the entry fee because he'd be willing to uh, front the next one. That's for not me. a bad. Yeah. That's not a bad, not a bad trade. Rates. That says I mean, a lot about yeah. how hot you are, at least. Yeah. Like, and that's a fun thing, at least. <laughs> It's like, well, but I would I would always just, you know, I would always sit back and say, you know what, this is great material for the book. Yeah, and it all made it into the book. Yeah. And it's I mean, it's teach it's character building. Yeah. And like, holy shit, I can outplay these guys. If yeah. that's what they're thinking, yes. then I can take advantage of that. That was, that's that was part superpower. two of my question. Is it uh, it is it is it a uh, uh, an advantage? And it seems like it probably is. Yeah, right? it ended up being at first it wasn't because yeah. I was not very good at poker. I was too mm. timid. I didn't have any confidence. I was totally out of my element. Mm. But once I actually started realizing what was going on and having kind of that metacognitive awareness mm. of myself, um, it became like I said, a total superpower because I could figure out, it became kind of this game of, okay, what do you think of me? What do you think of women? How do you think a girl plays poker? Because that's what you're thinking. Once I figure that out, I can completely exploit it. Right. And when you look at a guy at a table, you just think poker player. When you look at me, you think female. Right. And not poker, not poker player. You know, it's because a, that's what stands out about me. Yeah, and, and, and it's interesting you say that because that, that one night, when I was talking about at the Bellagio that I got into yeah. that, there was only one woman in that entire room. 
and yeah. she lost pretty quickly. And dude, the, the table just fucking erupted. I mean, they were like, dude, do you believe this girl? Fuck this girl, blah, 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 blah. I mean, it was relentless. But I, why would the, why would that, or finish your story? Yeah, no, but it, it was relentless. And I guess, because I had asked somebody else, I go, is that, is that unusual? And they were like, yeah, man, no women play. Um, and, and this was before the televised tournaments, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, I think when, you, when it got to television, you were starting to see more and more women play, so it became more commonplace. But before, because this is before it was televised, and dude, that, that chick was the only girl in the entire room, and she got slaughtered when she got out. And uh, it, it, was, it was... But yeah. I, that doesn't make any sense to me. I, if it were a fucking wrestling match or a basketball game, and a woman tried to play with men, I'd be like, that's probably not a great idea. But this is not... Why, why would a woman not be good at this? This seems like something a woman would actually be better at. Well, I, so I have, I have a theory on it, and I'm glad you asked that, because I was trying to think about it as well. When you go into these things, and I mean, me some of it is this garden variety misogyny. That's probably most of it. And dude, yeah, yeah, yeah. dudes yeah. don't want to feel like they're going to get beat by a woman sometimes, which is fucking stupid. Right. Like, well, right. are we going to have a contest to see who can give birth better to, motherfucker? I mean, what are we doing here exactly? <laughs> but, but, it's stupid. So here's my theory, and you can tell me if, if I'm correct in this, because you've played in a bunch of tournaments at this point, okay? Yeah. When you go to these things, especially late at night or, you know, that's when a lot of these are, right? Yeah, yeah. And you play into the early hours of the morning. What I found from the dude perspective was that most of these guys didn't sleep. They didn't shower. Uh, they stunk. They were weird. They had strange personal habits to themselves. So uh, it, it, this, this woman happened to be attractive who played. It was completely foreign to them. And they just did not know how to react to whatever. Some of it I felt like was out of like uh, shock that they were like, oh, well, this woman's in the tournament. And they didn't know how to treat her because these guys clearly hadn't showered in days. Right. Yeah. Um, the only women that were in the actual room that night uh, during this late night game at, at the Bellagio, and there was a lot of people in there, were actually masseuses. So uh, they have these masseuses that you could pay for yeah. to physically massage you throughout however yep. many games of poker you can play. And those were the only women in there. And I think that's just all they were used to. Um, so yep. maybe, I mean, there, I, there probably is some level of social awkwardness involved, but it kind of reminds me, it's honestly kind of pathetic because it reminds me of those fat neck beards living in their parents' basement, watching Miss Universe or whatever. And they're like, oh, they're eating like fucking Cheetos. With, you just described with, every male poker player. With orange stains <laughs> down their chest because they don't have a fucking napkin to wipe their hands on. And they're like, oh, her nose is kind of big, man. It's very similar. Yeah, like, get yeah. the fuck out of here. Are you out of your mind? Well, you know, from your perspective, it, like, do you ever see attractive dudes rolling there? And you're like, oh, man, that's, that's crazy. He doesn't look like he fits here. Like, there's usually a type. It's a tracksuit. Um, it's, uh, it's a gold chain. Uh, the headphone thing is huge now, too. Where they're all in headphones and sunglasses. Well, what's her name? Uh, Kim Kardashian showed up to a tournament. She had mirrored sunglasses on, which is probably not a good idea. <laughs> no, To hold not a, a mirror good idea. up with your fucking cards in front of you. But, hey, what do I know? She was out uh, very quickly. I'm not a night. scientist. Yeah. Uh, yeah, but I, the, the, whole, the whole premise around that is it's got to be maybe there's some level of social awkwardness, but I really think it's probably just garden variety dude bullshit, right? Yeah, I, I mean, I think I, it's a combination. Yeah, yeah, of both. Um, God, but when you start so winning, though, that's got to feel good. Oh, yeah. Where you're like, oh, oh it shit. feels amazing. Because it, all, it also puts more pressure on them because this is supposed to be their world, right? And then here's yeah. this girl coming in and taking all their money. And, and a lot of these people know each other. Yeah, well, it, you know, it's funny that you say that because I actually got a lot of shit and a lot more hatred when I started winning, um, especially after I started becoming better known, like after I won my first major international tournament, um, which was a big, you know, it was a big deal and got sponsored and people were like, you don't deserve this. You haven't been playing long enough. You didn't earn it. I'm like, what are you talking about? Like I, I've been working my ass off and I won this fair and square, you know, it's not like I didn't do anything weird, but they have this feeling of like, oh, you don't deserve it if you haven't been playing your whole life. And right. if that's like that new money you're versus just an outsider. old money debate, right? Yeah, like yeah. the the old the Vanderbilts uh, uh, yeah. don't like the like new tech billionaires because oh you just got your money like what the fuck does that mean, bitch? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, exactly. But but I will say that there is a difference between like the vast majority of poker players and then the elite, right? So people like my coach, like Eric, and all of the super high roller players, they are super nice mm. and smart and gracious, and they had my back. Like not only did they never give me shit, but like they protected me and made sure that 
everyone was treating me well. And when they saw someone not treating me well, they would stand up for me, That's good. which was great. Um, so having that protection and seeing what was possible really helped inspire me and realize that that's possible too, right? It's not all those guys uh, with the Cheeto stains down their front. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it's close. Have you ever played with those guys? Have you ever played with like Phil Helmuth or, or yeah. Ivy and those Daniel guys? Daniel Negrano. Wow. Yeah. How do you say his name? I've, like, I can't Daniel say Negrano. Yeah, Negrano. I've played with I've played with both Daniel and Phil. I've never actually played with Phil Ivy. Mm. Okay. Um, I like Dan. I like Negrano. He, I I actually watched his master class. It's pretty interesting. But it's it 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 is the same as any other fucking form of competition. From I mean, it, it's basically game theory, right? That's that's yeah. displayed in a different kind of way. Uh, uh, and you're you're learning about human beings. It's like one of my favorite books of all. Time, I'm not a religious person at all, but one of my favorite books is. Um, called the screw tape letters by c.s mm -hmm. lewis that's a wonderful book yeah it is really good if you haven't read it i even if you're not religious uh i would read it because the, the basic premise is screw tape is a demon in hell he's writing letters to his nephew on earth uh trying to train him on how to trick human beings into going to hell basically mm -hmm. right but it's just a, a treatise on human yeah. sociology or, or uh, psychology. it is great I mean, it's, it's, really it's good. a great book yeah yep one of my favorites yeah mm -hmm. and uh and when i was talking about poker being a metaphor for life yeah. it is uh, it I is? mean, it, it really is in every single facet, uh, business in, in particular, um, the, the business world and everything else. What's the highest amount of money you've won from a tournament? Um, let's see, that would have been the PCA won 120 something thousand in total. Holy shit. Like that. So at that point, do you look at writing as a hobby and this more of your as your profession <laughs> i mean i look i know writers get paid uh i mean that's no i mean for while i was doing this i really wanted to take it seriously so i did do it really full time like i studied i played i traveled the world um so one year the year where i was really seriously playing um i was on the road for eight months out of the year just to give you a sense of like how seriously i was taking it um but no i mean i'm i love writing it's what it, it's it, it's who i am um and so at this point um i think I have no plans to quit poker, but I also have no plans to quit writing. So yeah. the good thing is you can write from anywhere in the world. Um, and I think the two things are very compatible. Of course, live poker basically died over the last year because of mm -hmm. COVID. Mm -hmm. um, and so, um, you know, I've taken a step back and the last year has been all, all about writing, but I'm definitely looking forward to playing again once people get vaccinated and those big series start going again. Yeah, yeah. Um... Because it's, I find it interesting that uh, you started online and then yep. you're like live, but you won't go back I to do. online? I mean, I can't play online in New York. It's not legal here. So no, there's no regulated poker in New York. Um, so I have to go somewhere else, but I don't like playing online nearly as much as I like playing live. And to be perfectly honest, I'm not as good at it um, mm. because I have a psychology background. So one of my edges is in people and dynamics yeah. and kind of understanding yeah, yeah. the table. And that's something that I lose. Yeah. If you're, if you're playing if, online, if your superpower was probabilistic theory, then that would be a whole, you could probably play online would, and have the same yes. amount of success. But if you're, so if you're if you're watching hand movements and that's your how you determine yep. body because that's what I watch in an interrogation when I was in the military from yep. fucking somebody up I'm watching their hands because hands betray everything touching your face I love that line. you said that I have a whole uh, section of the book um, because I I worked with people who were looking at tells and mm -hmm. who actually studied tells in the poker table and it turns out that all the tells are in the hands mostly, and the yeah. face the poker face i mean most of the tells mm -hmm. and the poker face is kind of bullshit because our faces yeah. don't give away that much because everyone knows they're supposed to keep a poker face right. and that's what everyone is focusing on there are micro then, expressions that are helpful yes. but i mean even then a micro expression yeah. you don't know what they mean necessarily and also a micro expression can be caused by physical stimulus yeah whereas a hand sure. the hand thing it's very unlikely that i'm going to reach to my face and and just touch it briefly if it's if it's itching i'm going to do this sure right or if there's something on it i'm going to wipe it off but if i ask you a question you're like i don't know man it's like not a big deal it's a big deal because i did that frankly mm -hmm. that yeah. that is 99 percent of the time that's true i mean that's yeah that's well i love that i love that you said that um because that's what all the research into tells in poker and right. lying um shows as well so it's yeah. very cool I'm, yeah but I, yeah I, so i lose all of that when i'm playing online so if anybody's yeah. dating you probably don't lie to you is what you're saying not in person anyways over text it'll be fine you can tell all your lies through text but, but not, just not in, in person. person yeah there you go yeah because you're going to pick up on it 
Nobody can lie to me. No, that's not true. <laughs> <laughs> I think the reason I lost is because my face was like this at the table. <laughs> and I, I knew, like they knew, like, oh. Oh, my God. I remember, look, hand. despite the fact that I was playing online and, like, I was getting this wonderful coaching, I remember the first time I had pocket aces mm. in a live setting. My hands started shaking. And I was like, shit, stop shaking. And you, Why are you shaking? And you couldn't stop it. Yeah, there's no it stopping. Stop it. Once it. it starts, there's no stopping that shit. Did they know? Did everybody? Of course, just they fucking knew. Of course, cards? they knew. <laughs> Everyone folded. Yeah. <laughs> you don't even have to be good at reading people to spot something mm, like that. No. <laughs> That's really funny though, because everybody, if you're sitting at a good table, everybody's a professional, and every for the most part, like I, I would assume, a lot of the harassment you got was on the come up and not. At yes. The at the pinnacle. Yes, yeah. that is correct. You know, it, it, and I, I assume it's the same in, in every organization. You're going to find shitheads at the top of, of yep. any any industry, whatever it is. But most of the viper bullshit happens in the mid levels. It's people who are trying to step correct. on each other to get somewhere else. Without, I mean, it's not, it doesn't really play well with Nash's equilibrium theory. To be honest, I, I really no. would recommend people dip into that a little bit. And uh, I mean, shit, even without knowing it, McConaughey talks about it in Green Lights a little bit about how. Uh, being selfish sometimes can be a form of being selfless, right? Mm -hmm. If you you go after the best thing, but never to the detriment of other people, yeah, right? that's that's kind of that that is a very reductive uh, uh, view of of Nash equilibrium theory, uh, equilibrium theory. But uh, it is important to do that, right? If you're be responsible, be one of those guys that says, "Hey, I see that these people are fucking with you. Yeah. I'm not going to let that fucking happen anymore. Yeah. Not in my presence, right? I see it exactly." All the time. I think I think that that's so important. And I think that too many people, you know, they, they don't think long term mm. and poker. Yeah, sure. Any hand of poker, any game is zero sum. You know, I win, you lose, right. you win, I lose. But in the long run, I mean, it's a positive something because there's an ecosystem and it's repeated interaction and you see the same people and you're playing with the same people. And being an asshole does not pay mm. because literally yeah. you're not going to get invited to the good games right, if yeah. you play if you play cash. Right. You know, it, it literally doesn't pay. And you I think there's actually a lot to be said for stepping up being nice um stepping in when you see something's going wrong because then that person will come back and at that point you know when if you stepped in for me you know two years ago i'm a total fish you want me in the game you can take my money so be nice to me yeah there's also something you to know? be said for the uh for the back end of that where we we've become very comfortable uh, in, in our personal lives and business, but mostly in politics with dancing on the graves of our opponents. Anytime there's a point to be made, we mm -hmm. make that point and then celebrate that point as if it contributed somehow. Right. Like, yeah, we fucking got him this time. What exactly did you get, motherfucker? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You got yeah. nothing. People become more deeply entrenched because they feel attacked and no progress is made. You stupid yep. son of a bitch. Yeah. Like, what the fuck are we doing here? This is all really fucking basic human psychology, it is, by the way. It is. Yeah, but I, I would have to imagine with somebody like you, like I'm going through your bio here, um, NYU School of Journalism, uh, graduated from Harvard, received your PhD in psychology from Columbia. These are the most prestigious universities that our nation has to offer. The guys that you're going up against typically don't have a background like yours. Um, did you ever say that out loud at a table and let them know it? Uh, or, or did they find out about it later and say, oh shit, we can't fuck with her now because, I mean, that's crazy. Yeah. A PhD in psychology from Columbia is a boss move. Like, did you ever I, say uh, that to somebody? No, I did not. I actually, so I, one of my great assets is something that I lost as I became more well-known, which was my anonymity. No mm. one had any clue who I was. I was mm. just, you know, another girl um and that was nice because i was routinely completely underestimated and they had no idea and i would never say that because why would i it's more information you want to give as little information as possible and you want to try to get other people to give you as much information as possible because you know life's a game of information and the person with the informational advantage has the advantage yeah, yeah. so so that's always my strategy um but then Yes, it's it's very funny that you say that did someone figure it out after the fact. Yeah. So there was a very funny once I started playing bigger tournaments and doing well and being on televised tables um, and was kind of an ambassador for the game. I felt like, you know, I have to talk and be friendly and make a good televised table. Right. Actually, like, make it engaging for the people mm. watching because it is and entertainment. 
It is entertainment. Yes, exactly. It yes. is entertainment at yes. that point. Yeah. Um, and there was this guy who just wouldn't engage with me. He was just sitting there and he wouldn't talk. And he just was staring in front of him. And I was like, oh, my God, what did I ever do to this guy? And at some point he looks at me and he says, I'm really sorry. Can you please stop talking to me? You seem really nice. But my girlfriend told me I couldn't talk to you because you have a Ph.D. in psychology and you're oh. going to read me. <laughs> I was like, that's that's very very funny. That's, that so funny. yeah, so sometimes people would uh, once they found out they they would uh, not necessarily want to engage. But at the, then there came a point where people knew who I was, mm. um, and that's fine too. I yeah. mean, you know, they you 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 adapt. And then you can also use that to your advantage too. Yeah, like, for right, sure. Great right, going in. Um, I have. I'm yeah. I'm that woman who's got the the PhD from in psychology. Yeah, let me try to psych you out. Exactly. Well, I mean, it works. Uh, it's I I think of it like physics, right? So if I know the laws of physics, then I can throw an object and and, and predict how it's going to bounce off the wall, for example, right? Mm -hmm. If I know what you're thinking, then I can send stimulus in your direction, and I will I know how you're probably going to react to it more times out of not. And as a professional gambler. At least, if as a professional sports gambler, which is what we do, mm -hmm. if you're right, 60, 58 to sixty-two percent of the time, you're considered a professional. Yes. That's very good, yeah. right? So yeah, that's great. Yeah. yeah. So I mean, uh, and most people lose their shirt in sports betting. We 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 do very very well. I mean, well, I, I mean, I was gonna say that's good for us because it is somebody's yeah. got to lose, right? <laughs> Shit. Yeah. yeah. And it's not gonna be the house. That's never gonna happen. But I, mean, I will say for, this: at least I'm not going up against somebody else, right? I'm just going against mm -hmm. uh, in our Correct, yeah. in our case uh my bookie right. um is one of our sponsors mm -hmm. mybookie.com I, I don't know if you've played poker on there or any of their stuff there uh but uh they were international so you can go anywhere on that that platform oh. yeah. and um, you can also use uh, a vpn to mask your location and new york can get fucked frankly because why would why would they have a say in what i do in my house yeah 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 motherfucker yeah. like you can bet on sports in oh new york, listen don't 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 get me wrong i am the most vocal about legalizing online poker right, everywhere yeah. because it's such bullshit. I mean, you have a fucking lottery. The lottery now, that's cruel. Yeah. And yeah. that targets vulnerable people. Yeah. That's awful. And you use it for revenue yeah. for the state. And you say that online poker is gambling? Then give me a break. Yeah, I'm well, sorry. <laughs> the lottery is basically, I, th I don't remember who said it, but it's like a welfare a buyback program, basically. Yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a tax on the poor. Yeah, it's a tax it is, on the yeah. people who are least equipped to understand it. And it's that's gambling, pure yeah. and simple. I mean, that's a lottery. <laughs> and poker is a skill game, you mm -hmm. know, just like sports betting. Mm -hmm. At the end of the day, you know, you can have a skill edge Look, legitimately. You can make money over it, time. And our skill edge, and we've said this on the show before, because of uh, we own a ticketing company as well, we're able to get field passes. When we go down and see these players in real life, in particular college, not so much the NFL, the NFL is a, a professional game where uh, most of the players are the same size, speed, everything else. But in these college games, there is a world of difference against the top tier yeah. athletes and on you're that all, field you're versus also dealing, their opponents. You're also dealing with, uh, on average, for a normal regular season game, a 15 to 35 point spread. Yep. That is a lot. That's a that's a huge fucking delta in your in your gambling, mm -hmm. right? I mean, that's not that's not like uh, a binary one or zero. That is like. Not only are they going to win the game, but are they going to win by four fucking touchdowns? What's the impetus for that? You start, you have to start thinking about uh, uh, is what what about two weeks from now when they're playing this other team? Do they want to not risk injury late in the fourth quarter so they're not going to get those uh, uh, extra touchdowns? And the yep. other team is going to get a garbage touchdown and fuck that whole thing up. There's a lot going on there. Yeah. So the, being able to see it in person is very fucking beneficial. Very beneficial. There was one game that him and I uh, were covering. I'll never forget. It was uh, Clemson, MC, NC State. Oh, yeah. Uh, this Tre okay. Trevor Lawrence is, uh, is their quarterback. He's going to go number one in the draft this year, the mm -hmm. NFL draft here in a couple months. And that was the first time we got to see him in person. The spread on that game, I think, was 28 and a half. Yeah, and he scored 35 in the first quarter. 35 in the first quarter. And it, it, as soon as I saw, because we were down there, yeah. uh, as soon as I was standing next to him and how big he was in real life, yeah. I thought, I, like, I'm a big dude. I'm 6'3 and a half, about 225. Um, and he was towering over me and just mm. absolutely shredded, right? Yeah. And I was like, oh, my God. And I looked at the other team. He looked like a man amongst children out it, there. He was a full head above everybody else. And <laughs> I was like, they're going to smash him. I was able to go on my phone uh, before the game started, bet it. Um, and uh, and sure enough, yeah, yes, we blew out that cover. And it was amazing. But, yeah, yeah there is there is a definite live element to it that that is a big, big advantage. Um, so I completely understand that. Um, now, here it says your winnings have tallied now mo or over... $300,000, is that true? That is true. Holy shit. 
What'd you, what'd you do with it, if you don't mind me asking? She paid 60% <laughs> of it to the state of New York. Yeah, for tax. That is, that's actually correct. Most people, when they when I say 60%, they're like, ha ha, very yeah, funny. I'm like, 60%. no, actually, that's yeah. what you pay for them. Yep, 60% went to New York, and yeah, then no I wasn't writing. Yeah. yeah, oh yeah, for sure. So it was uh, living expenses and yeah. travel um, yeah. for poker. I mean, it's, you know, it's not all profit either because you, there are, all the tournaments that I Entry entered fees, that I didn't yeah. cash aren't yep. on there. Right. Right. And and it's all about risk management too. Mm. So talk about business analogies. You mm. don't, it's not just bankroll management where you make sure that you're not paying with playing with too much of your bankroll, but then how do you manage your risk? So I would sell mm. pieces of my action. So I had, you know, what you see on the Hendon mom, you know, me winning over 300,000. I didn't actually get all of that because there was someone, you know, someone would have 10%. Right. Um, yeah. And the way that it works is if you don't win anything, they still they pay you 10 percent. So it helps mitigate the costs and all of that. Right. But then if you win, they get 10 percent. So and these are these are uh, people uh, uh, footing the fee or, or a sponsorship like you're wearing their brand during the tournament. Or whatever. No, no, these are just individuals. So, yeah. like, for instance, you if the two of you talk to me and you're like, you know, we think Maria has a real edge over this field. Mm. Um, Maria, can we? buy five percent of your action mm. i would say sure and so if it was a you know ten thousand dollar tournament get five percent of it and so you give me that money and i use it for the entry fee mm. um and then if i don't win then you guys just lost it it was right. a you know you you bet on me and i lost for you but if i make money then you get ten percent are most um, and uh, so you make money you make money back yeah are most of these tournaments uh winner take all are there like a tiered structure of payouts or how does it work because i'm not really tiered structure yeah, yeah. always yeah. so but it's always top heavy of course so right? i mean you want it to be because um, yeah. you, you want so, that final table to be fucking nuts right? exactly that's so that's what it always is so if you're the kind of person who always min caches mm. this was a huge lesson i had to learn because i used to get very very cautious right when we were near the the bubble the money right, bubble because yeah, yeah. i wanted to cash yeah um and people who are professionals will mercilessly take advantage of that because that's not the point. You're going to lose money if you keep min cashing because the expenses of traveling and of playing right. um, outweigh, you know, whatever you make a hundred bucks or whatever mm -hmm. it is. So you really have to go for the win. You have to go for the top. And so your strategy has to be much more aggressive. And so you take advantage of people like me or the player I was before I realized this or was taught this. Um, and you take advantage of the fact that they just want to cash. They want that score. Yeah. On the, um, and so you you bluff them and you are aggressive because they're going to fold everything mm. because they don't want to be the last person out right before the money. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, Maria, you're an interesting person um, because your your life, like I'm, I'm just going through it. How many books have you actually written? I know two of them have been New York Times bestsellers, correct? I've written three and all three have been New York Times bestsellers. Oh, look three at that. <laughs> Nothing like getting corrected live on air. I love that. Um, I, I do that to people all the time. Uh, that's great. Tell that. Tell Amazon to change your profile. Uh, they, okay. they, they still got you listed at two. They still got you listed at two underneath the Amazon authors there. Um, Sorry. Sorry about that. that. No, that's Amazon's <laughs> fault. They don't give a shit. Um, are you kidding me? Um, but all of these books are it's completely different. Um, yeah. Was that on purpose or? I just write about what I'm interested in. Um, and, you know, if you look in retrospect, I think there's some sort of arc there. Mm. Like my first book was about Sherlock Holmes um, and how to think better and think right. more clearly. And it was really about mindfulness and paying attention and being present. And the fact that the reason that Sherlock Holmes was so good at being a detective was because he was so good at mindfulness. Um, so that was kind of, you know, the nice detective element of the world. My second book was about con artists and I spent multiple years with con artists and their victims learning, you know, how people con and scam each other. And like Deanne Warwick and shit. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Who, I think who she's probably the... dead by then, but no, she's alive. Oh, she alive? She's still alive. She's on yeah. Twitter. She's at, she's like she's like a Twitter, Twitter celebrity. Yes. Oh, whenever like, she tweets, it trends. So, so it's like, like Rex, oh, yeah. Rex Chapman, these people that were complete pieces of shit Correct. during their entire lives, and now all of a sudden they're fucking Twitter cool. Yeah, it's like, weird. Are you fucking man. kidding me, dude. So Twitter's a weird. Mm -hmm. world. OJ's on Twitter too. Yeah, yeah. So. And he got vaccinated for oh, everybody else. Good for him. It's it's going to the right people, which is important. Why Sherlock Holmes? 
Uh, what do you um, mean, why Sherlock Holmes? You don't like Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, motherfucker? You don't like deductive reasoning? <laughs> nah, I What's do. your problem, asshole? I do, but like, there's been a lot of, no offense. He but doesn't like Benedict Cumberbatch. That's his problem. Well, I hate Cumberbatch. I've never been a Batch This fan. was pre-Cumberbatch, so oh, this wow. book was before Sherlock. I mean, yeah, but, but there's been a lot of takes on Sherlock yeah. Holmes. Why, why did you decide to do it? But there wasn't any take on the psychology of right. Sherlock Holmes. And I kind of, it was an accident in the sense that I was writing, a, I was asked to do a piece about mindfulness. And this was mm. before mindfulness was a catchphrase, like mm. no one knew what it was. And so I was trying to figure out, you know, how do I explain this? And the image that came to mind was from one of the Sherlock Holmes stories. So when I was a little kid, um, my dad would read out loud to us, um, to all uh, lots of brothers and sisters. There's, um, there were four of us and we would all have Sunday night reading and he read the Sherlock Holmes stories to us when I was little. Um, and so, you know, childhood memory is very powerful. They kind of yeah. stick. And so there was one, this one scene that I really remembered well, and it was when Holmes asks Watson how many steps lead up to 221B Baker Street right, yeah. and Watson doesn't know. Right. And I just, when I was a kid, I was just totally shocked by this. I made my dad stop reading so that I could count the number of stairs that led up to kind of our front door and yeah. like from first floor to second, because I was a little confused about, you know, fictional characters. So I wanted to make sure that when Sherlock Holmes asked me, yeah. I'd know the right number of stairs, but obviously missed the point totally when I was a kid. But now as an adult, when I was writing this piece about mindfulness, I remember that scene and I was like, wait, that's mindfulness. Because mm. right? what Holmes says is the difference between us is you only see, I both see and observe. Right. And that's mindlessness versus mindfulness. And so I wrote this piece and it ended up being the most successful thing I'd ever written. And so I decided to reread the home stories because I hadn't ever read them as an adult. And I was like, holy shit, this is a gold mine. Like this is such a beautiful map of the human mind and human psychology. And I wrote a few more columns about homes and they did well and they sold the book. That's cool. Yeah. I mean, that's that's kind of an analog for uh, uh, modern society with smart technology. Right. So uh Neil said it last week on the show, but or I'm sorry, he called himself Tyson. Should he we did. say that too? We had Neil deGrasse Tyson on the yeah, show last so we, week. And he, he called himself Tyson. He called himself which Tyson. Was a baller move. I, yeah. I we made fun of him. <laughs> we made fun of him a little bit for that, but it's fine. <laughs> Should um, I be calling myself Konnikova? Is that kind of? I think so. I would yeah. think about it. Yeah, I would think Just about go, it. Just go go straight mononym, but don't go sting. Yeah, that's you can't go like the no, edge weird. or like a one no, word that's, thing. Well, the edge or... is technically two words. Not even technically, it is two words. Yeah, yeah, but yeah, I get it. No, it's. <laughs> it, he said this phrase that, that he said quite a bit before we have smartphones and dumb people, right? So mm -hmm. we, we have more access to information ever than ever right now, but we're not smarter in any way for it. As a matter of fact, we're dumber probably for it because um, we've condensed what it feels like to know something into sound bites. And that's just yeah. not, I mean, your, your work is, is proof that that is, not good right i mean it, no. it's 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 certainly not good for the national discourse because the the second and third order well the second order effect of that is immediate uh it doesn't take any time at all and what it is is you build a schema or an archetype for whomever the out group is the other right so if i if i am a liberal and i go on to fox news and i read the headlines i think that most people who identify or whatever the fuck is conservative just believe the headlines of fox news and maybe that's true maybe it's not but you can't confirm that by simply reading Fox News. You have to talk to human beings. Yeah. And then typically through that conversation, there are levels of nuance where you're like, oh, shit. You don't think any of that stupid shit, right? And yeah. vice versa with the fucking liberal media as well. So uh, we, we are dumb as fuck is the, is the point of all that. Just in general as a culture, we've tried to get somewhere faster than we were intended to get there. Mm -hmm. And we are now suffering the consequences of that on a daily basis. Right. Yeah. And, and, you know, with you, with the con artist book, um, did, mm -hmm. did you actually hang out with like real con artists and all that stuff? I did. Yeah. I did some of my interviews in prison. Some of them had been caught. Oh, that's dope. Who anybody, did you get like uh, Jordan Belfort, anybody like that? No, no, I did not talk to Jordan. Um, but, and I tried to do people who were not very well known, mm. um, so that it would be like, I did not, I, I didn't go for Bernie Madoff, but I went for less well-known Ponzi schemers right. um, I mean, and the original Ponzi schemer who was not Ponzi, yeah. who was pre pre Ponzi. Was he pissed about that? Well, he's dead. That he so. didn't get the credit he deserved Ponzi, you know? Oh, yeah. Because if, like, if you <laughs> well, create he, a scheme like that, no, he, you, you, you mean the original? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, so Franklin? No, I don't think so. I mean, he went to jail, too. 
yeah. and then he eventually eventually got out of jail people believed in him until the end mm. i mean brilliant scamster yeah oh yeah even the guy from next who when i was talking about earlier like dude there was girls that came out at the end of that trial and they were like no I was oh my god, and- that's that is one of the things that I found over and over and over that the victims of con artists, even after the con was exposed, mm. so often just kept believing in it. That's how much you buy into it. And they're like, no, no, there's there's a total explanation for this. Um, no, no, this isn't really a con. This was a conspiracy. And right, they yeah, come yeah. up with all of these reasons why they weren't con. And I actually did um did do my la- the last chapter of that book. Um, was kind of the ultimate con, the cults. Mm. Um, and I did not talk to any cult leaders, but I did talk to some people who were uh, professional cult exfiltrators. Right, yeah. So they um, basically joined cults and figured out how to get in so that they could get someone out. Mm. So they were hired by victims' families um, and figured out how to get them out of that situation, which is pretty damn cool. Yeah, that yeah. is actually cool. And, and it also proves that there is a job out there for anyone. You know, yep. if I, if uh, look, I, yes, if I had to go into a sex cult and get somebody out of there, it would be a conversation that I had with my wife, but if they were paying enough money, obviously I would have to do it. <laughs> well, look, the, that's the world. The bad news for you is that sex cults very rarely uh, benefit the male initiates, right? I mean, it's, it's mostly for the leader. Right, right, right. right. <laughs> so you're basically getting cucked the whole time. Yes. That's yes, how that works, yes. which is, you know, if that's your thing, then God bless. But. Yeah, my yeah. wife is super into that. She was talking about Jim Jones. She's super and those into guys, getting and She was like, you know, he was fucking dudes too, right? And I was like, <laughs> no, why? And it was more of a dominance thing. And I was like, all right, well, shit. Well, I understand that. Uh, <laughs> From a dominance perspective, sure. Obviously. Yeah. yeah. Gotta, Obviously. Sometimes you got to do it. Uh, now, I, what, you're, what you're describing is essentially cognitive dissonance, right? I mean, we. we oh, yeah. We, it, it's, and it's, and it's, uh, uh, it's one of the. the the tears, I su- suppose, of post-traumatic stress, uh, along with catastrophizing and and uh, emotional reasoning and things like that. But uh, w- it is it is an assault on the psyche to be exposed yeah. or to, to have something you truly believe in be exposed as fake. People uh, find out things they believed about. Like if aliens showed up here right now, there are a lot of religious people that would lose their fucking minds because they would have no context. Like, how does yeah. this fit into my worldview? And every time, look, that's the reason the church fought back so hard against uh, the, uh, the, the, uh, uh, what the fuck, the, uh, the sun being the center of the solar system, for example, right? Like, no, the earth, man, we're important. The yeah, earth. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And yeah. They, they literally exiled and imprisoned and killed people yeah. for saying otherwise. Like, are you fucking serious? That that's how it works, right? People, it, yeah. it is, it is, uh, it triggers some, I don't know if it's the selling game. It's some part of the fight or flight mechanism to hear information that challenges your worldview. And look, we're oh, for it's on, sure. it is on full fucking display right now. No matter <laughs> which which side of the political aisle you fall on, whether you believe in masks or don't, I don't know why you wouldn't believe that a, a mask blocks water coming out of your face. The point is who is susceptible to it and who is not and how we handle the economic situation. That's the real debate. But anyways, uh, the left versus right thing. Like all of my... Yeah super liberal friends right now are incredulous about Biden's handling of the immigration system so far. The cages are still open and blah, blah, blah. Not only are they open, but they've, they've expanded, re- they've yeah. expanded yeah. and shit like that. Uh, still no stimulus shit and, and, and blah, 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 blah. All the stuff, all the hypocrisy in politics. Polit- politicians are full of shit anyways, but. Uh, Indeed. Uh, yeah. uh, that's, I, have a, I have a brand. It's called All Politicians Are Cunts. Right. Yeah. He calls it uh, APAC. APAC. Yeah. Which is better than CPAC, <laughs> by the way. Correct. CPAC can get fucked. Uh, at any rate, uh, yeah, people, you challenge their worldview. And I think it's the problem with what it means to know something. We, we these in out group things that are going on right now, and, and the Weinstein brothers do a good, get a bit of uh, talking on this subject, um, as does uh, Douglas Murray, but the in out group thing where I have to subscribe to points you know, one through seven on this side or one through seven on this side. And that's how I identify. But it is like the ultimate form of social confirmation bias where, well, if you don't believe all seven of these things, you're not a fucking conservative. You're a fucking rhino, man. Fuck you. Like, do I have to believe everything you believe? What exactly are we going for right here? You know what I mean? It's it's a, no, I, I couldn't agree more. I mean, I've, I'm someone who has argued for, 
as long as I can remember, at least since high school, I wrote a paper on it against the against partisanship, like against mm. the partisan model, because it blocks people from having to think, right? right? Just think through the fucking issues. Yeah. What do you think about this? What do you think about that? Like mix and match, figure out what you actually believe in and then figure out who you support based on kind of the things that are important to you. Don't do it because you're a Republican or a Democrat and your ticket says, I mean, that's mindlessness, right? Yeah. That's kind of the, it completely undercuts critical thinking. Right. And, and I, I'm just, I'm against very strong uh, partisanship, whether it's political or religious yeah. <laughs> or, or anything. As, as soon as you have kind of this mindset of, you know, evangelical, like this is what I am and this defines me, that's the moment your mind just completely closes off. Right to critical thinking and that's when cognitive dissonance mm -hmm. is going to operate where your dissonance reduction is going to be mm -hmm. so strong that you're going to just be willing to totally dismiss the evidence that's in front of your eyes right. because it just contradicts your beliefs. Yeah. People, people that went to uh, the Affordable Care Act website on day one or people that have spent time in the DMV believe that there are these vast government run conspiracies. I'm like, dude, I've worked for the government. They are incompetent as fuck. <laughs> like if you really believe the government is, look, they're doing it in the open. That's the problem. They're taking your money and then giving it back to you and calling it a fucking gift. Yeah. yeah Motherfucker, yeah, yeah. You, yeah. You, you, took, you took my money and you're giving some back to me and now look, well, thanks man, yeah. appreciate it. You fucking kidding me? We're dumb as shit. Yeah. I say that a lot, but it is always true. But I still, I mean, I have, I still, I believe in us. Like, I feel like humanity is capable of so much more right. if we, like, I, I feel like. It is, so here's the thing, it is, <laughs> it is capable. I just think that nobody is capable of doing it anymore. And I, I, we did a show, was it yesterday, I think, where I was just like, you know, I've kind of given up on the, the notion that we're all gonna come together and be one and-, and Well, there's a problem with, else. so the individual person is fine, right? But when you start to group and form and out groups, then all these other psychological, whether it's the bystander effect yeah. yes. or cognitive yes. distance. So yep. uh, I hate to quote Tommy Lee fucking Jones, although he is a, I, I actually, he went to Yale, didn't he? Sorry, yeah. excuse me. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, all good. Yeah, sorry about that. Uh, <laughs> and, and Men in Black, he says, I, and I hate to quote Men in Black to you, but he says, a person is smart, people are dumb, panicky, dangerous animals, and you know it, right? So the, if I, I, I reference this from time to time, but if you've never looked into the, uh, uh, the Kitty Genovese thing, uh, the bystander effect study, uh, the, there's some principle where the more people witness some kind of fucked up event, the less likely anybody is to react to it, right? Mm -hmm. In any kind of helpful way. That's, that's reductive, but it's essentially that. People in large groups, there's so much stuff going on. Like, I don't want to be judged by this person. And, so, and a lot of it comes from a good place. Some of it's like, well, I don't want to fucking tell them how to think or step on their toes or anything. But look, that kind of uh, 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 safetyism, which is per pervasive through our society now, and it has completely fucked up our education system, is a horrible, horrible thing. Bad ideas do not get exposed in a vacuum. They don't get exposed by censorship. They don't get exposed by shouting or, or, or demonizing or catastrophizing or this shit. Bad ideas get exposed by good ideas, right? I don't know what hot feels like unless I felt cold and vice versa. I don't know what good feels like unless I felt pain. So you have to juxtapose these two things in their own merit. Have that conversation where the, here's, here's the plan and it's not the liberal plan or the conservative plan. Here is the plan. Like imagine there's liberal math or, or, mm -hmm. or fucking Muslim science. That doesn't make any goddamn sense, nor should it. No. Because you no. can't, there's no intersectionality with, with reality. That's just not how it works. Yeah, I mean, I, I, what I would wish if I were kind of designing my ideal education system, mm -hmm. it would be that kids are taught two skills, critical thinking mm -hmm. and kindness. Right. And I think those two things together just learn how to think critically about the world that's why i think poker is such a great game mm -hmm. because it off it helps you with a lot of those skills though not a, not always i mean there are some very stupid poker players right. but that's a different story but it's a social um, meritocracy though right i mean at the end of the day the person that played the social game the best is probably going to win unless there was some kind yeah of the person who thought the best is going to right. win mm -hmm. yeah for sure yeah. um but but yeah i think critical thinking and kindness taken together are going to i mean I hate to say make the world a better place, but they will, because yeah. if you 
kind of approach everything skeptically and critically and analyze it for yourself and know how to do that. You know, how do you actually take this and tease it apart? And if you're kind, and if your first impulse is to be kind to other people and to try to empathize and be understanding and try to figure out, okay, what's going on rather than jumping to judge right away, I just think the world would be a much better place. Social media probably wouldn't mm. exist, but, yeah, <laughs> but it would be, but it would be so much better. I that, think those are the two most important skills we can, yeah. we have. That's one of the rules of debate. I can't remember the exact phrase, but the general concept is that you should give the person you're arguing with or debating the benefit of the doubt. Take their words in the best possible meaning and not the worst possible meaning right, yeah. off, right off the face. Because um, we don't do that. Like if, right, you can see it right now. Uh, Cuomo the other day said to, uh, this is uh, Chris, the guy on CNN, said to Don Lemon, uh, uh, you know deep down I'm black inside or something like that. That is was in context, it was funny, they're clearly friends, nobody should ever be offended by that. The right was like, if a fucking Republican said that, then blah, 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 and they're right. If a Republican had said that, he would have gotten shredded. Yep. There's no question about that. But that has to stand on its own. If, it was, if it's okay in any sense, it's okay in every sense, right? You have to take this fucking shit out of here, make your own decisions about how things are going right now. Yeah. Uh, I, I just, I feel like, I'm sure you, I, if, I would assume you've read uh, The Coddling of the American Mind. It's been out for a while now. That seems like a book that you would have read. Uh, they, there's this phrase that comes up over and over in the book, and it says, prepare your children for the road, not the road for your children, right? So if in your world that you're talking about, people have to be prepared for reality as it exists, right? And you're, what you're talking about is an inoculation to what we've arrived at today. The inoculation is free thought and exchange of information uh, with the underlying empathy, right, attached mm -hmm. to it. That should be the case for everybody. If it's not, oh, then you're a piece sure. of shit, frankly. Yeah. If, you're, if, you're not, if you're not trying to think critically and come up with real answers, and you're not doing it from a place where you're trying to help not just yourself, but everybody, then you're a fucking piece of shit, yep. honestly. So stop waving your flag or stop waving your fucking pink hat, whatever, whichever no. side you're on, and shut the fuck and up I mean, and help people. There is, I, I will say though, you know, you give someone the benefit of the doubt at the beginning, right? And take the nicest meaning. And then right. if they prove you wrong, then <laughs> that yeah. that also happens. There's, yeah, of course, yeah. there's definitely, uh, I'm not saying just be kind to everyone always. No, and no. Yeah. Forgive everyone always. But that should be your starting point. That has to be, yeah. your, That has to be your starting point. Yeah, I would you say- You can't start off as like a judgmental, I, I'm right, you're wrong. Right. Because you have to start off with an open-minded and open-hearted mm approach to to everything and right. then you can figure out okay what's real what's not you know which how do i how do i parse this information how do i take it in context how do i analyze it and if you think about kind of a classic education with like ancient greeks ancient romans they taught rhetoric and that a lot of that right. was tools of logic yeah. and they Socratic taught logic method, yeah. exactly yeah. they taught critical thinking mm. if you think about kind of the decathlon the 10 topics so many of those are about how to think critically about right. the world and somewhere along the way it became oh math and science and you know we need to we need to learn the stem stuff and mm. yeah sure but you also need to learn how to think yeah. and not what to think how to, how to think that's the exactly big, that's the big exactly difference. i think that one of the more extreme examples is people that join the military in the united states so it's an all volunteer service but we still have very high participation rates compared to other countries that don't have compulsory service if you ask the average member of the military why they joined you will hear almost the same thing in different phrasing i love my family i love my country whatever, blah, blah, blah. I don't like bullies comes up a lot, mm -hmm. right? Uh, and whether or not we perform as bullies on the world stage is another uh, debate to be had. But uh, it, 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 seems to be, it seems to come from a baseline of protection, right? Yeah. Like that is the, the purpose of strength, biologically speaking, is to protect. Mm -hmm. The reason that some uh, creatures develop a shell is to protect the inside. The reason we have a rib cage is to protect our heart, right, and our right. internal organs. The reason that strong people exist in society is not to take advantage of weak people. It is to protect weak people. That's the whole fucking point. And if you're not coming from that perspective, again, you're a piece of shit. Right. If you're using your power, or strength, or position, or privilege to hurt people and not help people, then that's a fucking problem, right? And it's a problem yeah. that has to be addressed, whether it's through... Uh, whether you're a politician, whether you're a criminal, whether you're a fucking uh, a rogue state, it doesn't matter what it is. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And we, we've, we've 
become far too comfortable with casually labeling people who are kind of minor nuisances or, or uh, uh, disagree with us to a little bit maybe in the grand scheme of things as the enemy or evil or Hitler or whatever the fuck. It's, it's goddamn ridiculous that we've gotten to this point, man. And I don't know, honestly, I don't know what the way out of any of this stuff is. I would like to hear your thoughts because clearly uh, you're, you're a very critical thinker. So I would like to hear what you think about how we, like particularly you have a very good education at some of the most pre prestigious universities in the country. But even those Ivy League schools are having very difficult time right now dealing with the internet generation of students coming in that want to be protected from everything. So I don't, I don't know, I don't know how we move forward from this. It is very confusing for me, especially with COVID. <laughs> no, no pressure, by the way. Just yeah, save the world, right quick. Say, just save the world. Just save the world for us, real quick, on the on the way out of here. Excellent, excellent. Well, honestly, I mean, I think that what we were just talking about is part of the solution for, you know rewarding people and teaching people how to think through things and giving people time. That's one of the luxuries that we often don't have in this constant environment of social media and, oh my God, can you believe this happened? Outrage, got to fire right away, got to do this right away. Give some time to reflect and to cool off. So when I, um, when I was at Columbia, um, I studied, my advisor was Walter Michel, who is well known as the marshmallow guy, mm. the guy who actually created the marshmallow test. I was his last gra uh, grad student. So everything I was studying was about self-control and how to cool hot stimuli and how to actually take a step back so that you can be critical mm. because in the moment you can't. It's like poker being on tilt, mm. right? When you're, when you're on tilt, when you're in the hot emotional condition, you can't make a good decision. You can't play well. You can't actually come to the right conclusion because it's too personal and your emotions mm. are in it. And so I feel like one of the big solutions to this is actually looking, having the time to look at context and to figure out, okay, well, what's the, what's the punishment here? Was, what was this person intending to try to understand and approach with empathy and kindness and context? And sometimes the answer is going to be, holy shit, this person's a piece of shit. Mm, right. And everything that we've said about them is deserved and then some. That happens. But sometimes it will also happen that you'll be like, oh, this wasn't actually so bad and they didn't mean it. And they since like it was a sincere gaffe or it wasn't even a gaffe, because if you look at the full context, it wasn't at all what what you think it was. And then you move forward. Um, and that used to be possible a lot more in the pre-social media age, because I think one of the things that social media has done is create this time pressure mm. and create this public me uh, pressure and create this mob mentality, mm. which frankly is the enemy, the antithesis of critical thinking yeah. and of being able to think clearly. Yeah, you can um, ask Rome about that, by the way, but they don't exist anymore because <laughs> they allowed, they're, they're, there's this old quote from, from the Roman Senate and it's uh, 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 at Scipio, another, a number of people wrote it, but Rome is the mob. That was the quote, right? Mm -hmm. uh, good luck, motherfucker, with that bullshit, because yeah. as soon as the mob doesn't like you, yeah, you're yeah, done. Yeah, yeah. That's you're the, right. I mean, that is the, it, it is first they came for the socialists right like we have to we have to read that and understand the fucking words in front of us yeah i mean you have to i think i think that's important and i think it's important to see the world this is another thing that poker teaches you um see it in shades of gray hmm. you know the world is not black and white yeah some things are black and white um you know i'm i'm jewish and hmm. yes i do think that and i've lost family in the Holocaust. Like that was pretty black and white. Yeah. Like I'm, I'm, I'm pretty black and white about that. And I think yeah. that there are lots of, but in general, people are, people are shades of gray and you need to be willing to look at the world with nuance and right. not necessarily just stick labels on people. And psychologically, that's what we want to do because right. it's so much easier. It it's is. so it's much lazy. easier that's to have. It's lazy. lazy. It, it is, is intellectually lazy, yeah. it, but it's so much easier because we don't like the human brain doesn't like uncertainty. It doesn't like ambiguity. And you know what? That's the world. But the it's, world's uncertain. It's probabilistic. Yeah. It's ambiguous. And it's, it's we also, need to learn to deal with it. It's also easy to go home and order uh, fast food, right? Yeah. Every night instead of cooking good food for yourself but there's a goddamn consequence of that shit and we're seeing we're seeing some of the consequences now i think about brett weinstein and, and what he went through there, there was this um it was a, like a national day where underrepresented people whether it be uh people of color uh gay trade whatever it is 
uh, we're, we're going to take the day off of school, but we're doing a walkout to, for solidarity, whatever the case is, right, mm -hmm. uh, for awareness. And he, the, the, it pivot, I don't know if you're familiar with the story, but it pivoted one year where they were like, you know what, we're going to have a day where white cis people aren't allowed here or whatever the fuck, right? And he's like, um, that's probably not a good idea. Like, right. it's one thing for you guys to opt out of the day to celebrate whatever you're celebrating or to bring focus in or whatever, they, or start a conversation, whatever, but telling people because of how they look that they can't come here, that is where I draw a line. That's kind of fucked up, right? right. So he got shredded for this shit. Yep. He and his wife got fucking shredded for it and eventually uh, you know, had to leave their positions there. And it's, the guy's intent clearly was not to stifle conversation. As a matter of fact, he and his brother are two of the fucking thought leaders in the, in the country right now. And they're certainly not conservatives. They're certainly not anti uh, LGBTQI, whatever the fuck letters, I can't remember all of them now. They're not anti people of color, they're not anti any of this shit. He was coming from a very good place, but because that conversation took place over the course of three days and not three months or three years, then it happened the way it happened and he lost his career over it. It's yeah. fucked up, man. And, and the lesson is, and it was one of the first big cancels, right, mm -hmm. in 2017. The lesson is we, the mob, with our emotional reasoning and our lack of, of deductive reasoning, can, if we bind, uh, bind ourselves together, influence major shit in this mm -hmm. country. And we saw it again with the fucking, the GameStop yeah. stock, right? I mean, yeah. a, 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 a it, big that's enough- up again through the moon yeah. today. AMC's up. <laughs> a, big uh, enough, yeah. a big enough group of people with no evidence to support their theory can enact their theory at a national level right now. Yes. That is a fucking problem yeah. for everybody, right? And it's not, a, it's not a problem that you can solve through authoritarianism because that shit always fails. Mm -hmm. It's a problem that has to be solved by teaching people how to think critically. But I will say that universities, governments, businesses have to have a no tolerance policy for this cancel culture bullshit. Otherwise, like if you feed, whatever you feed in life, uh, yourself, your body, or, or your, your brain, or whatever it is, or your social groups, whatever it is, whatever you feed, the result is gonna be you know, commensurate with what you fed them. And if you keep feeding these people positive stimulus for, for acting in a mob, way then they're just going to keep getting more emboldened and continue doing it and it's mm -hmm. not good for anybody it's not good for them that's the problem people think because it works for me right now then it works but that's right. not the case you plan for the future motherfucker you yeah. plan in the, in the if, if i put this tool in the hands of an evil actor how much damage can they do with it and how easy it is how easy is it to stop them from doing it and right now somebody that wanted like if 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 a foreign country wanted to start an information operation in this country and get uh, the woke crowd all tuned up about something, it wouldn't be that hard to do it, right? Right. That's a problem. We can't be that vulnerable intellectually. But we are. Yes. Uh, and that's the simple truth of it. And, you know, I, I don't know how to correct that, and I don't know how to, to fix that problem. Obviously, Maria, you were supposed to, and you didn't, clearly. Yeah, thanks a lot. Um, for thanks, thanks for nothing, Maria. Uh, I feel like you didn't save the world. Yeah, go spend that, your $300,000. On, a, <laughs> on another degree. <laughs> totally kidding. Um, this is the point in the show where you get to the drinking bro of the week, which is someone who has inspired you or helped you become the person you are today. This can also be a lady, uh, if you so choose as well. Uh, we have uh, a spinoff show called The Drinking Broettes as well with, that is, uh, with our female coast. So you can, you can do whatever you want. Uh, who has inspired you and helped you the most? Well, um, there are too many people, honestly. Mm -hmm. um, so we can go all Oscars and start to uh, mm -hmm. thank all the people who've, uh, who've helped me get here. But I think um, the, the person that I would love to highlight, well, two people, but one of them um, who unfortunately is no longer with us is someone who I mentioned earlier on Walter Michelle, who was my graduate advisor, mm -hmm. who was one of the wisest people I'd ever met um, and who died before um, I finished The Biggest Bluff. So I ended up dedicating it to him. But he just, he taught me a lot about the world and how to approach it and how to think about it. And it's, he was a rare person who was in academia and was, you know, one of the greats of psychology of the 20th century. And I was completely honest with him when I went for my PhD and said, I don't want to go into academia. I actually think this is really interesting. And I want to learn how to think about it at a high level, but I want to be a writer. And he said, great, too many people these days are way too focused on just their one thing and they have blinders on. And I think it's amazing. Mm -hmm. And I think more people should be like that. Let's do it. 
And so that's so rare, someone who actually encourages that and who encourages knowledge for the sake of knowledge, who says, you know, if you're interested in psychology and you're good, come study with me, you know, I will, I will share my wisdom with you. And it doesn't matter if you're doing it for any reason, other than to understand how to think better and how people think. Right. And to me, that's just such an inspiring attitude. I think, especially these days, so much of education and so much of what people choose to do with their time is for a purpose in the sense of, I will make money with this, or this is good for X career, or this is how it will be useful. You don't know how things are going to be useful. You don't know what life is going to be like. You can't see the future. Mm. Um, and it's so wonderful to just be free to do things because they interest you and to be curious. Mm. And he's someone who really, I think, inspired and um, encouraged me to always be curious. The other person I will say is my mom. Yeah. <laughs> no, seriously, she's um, a remarkable woman who came here. I mean, I was born in the Soviet Union mm. back when it was the Soviet Union, came here, um, got divorced right away um, and had no money, was a political, was a refugee basically mm. from stateless, yeah. <laughs> a, a refugee from the Soviet Union and raised us um, she did get remarried and the person I call my dad is my is actually my stepdad and he's absolutely incredible. But um, originally it was just us and we had no money. And it's kind of amazing that I grew up poor and I didn't realize it. And that's because she never made us feel poor. Mm. Like she just always supported us, loved us. And there was never this question of, oh, wow, did you realize that all the clothes you're wearing um, are donations? Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> and, and that's amazing. Yeah. And she's one of uh, the strongest women I know. Well, that's the case for most first generation Americans, frankly. Yeah. yeah. Uh, there's no it, it is it is grapes, coffee, beans, whatever it is, struggling on the vine produces the best product, right? And it's we've we've we're we're really working hard to remove the struggle from adolescence, and that is a I can't imagine a bigger mistake to make for the future of a country, right? Yeah. I mean, it's just like it's 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 like being an athlete and you stop going to the gym, man. Yeah. Like what what do you think the fucking result's gonna be? Uh, I'm glad to hear that. That's great. Proud of your mom for doing that. Uh, we have a friend <laughs> who's the same, Kirill. He's he took a much different path in life, but ah, still very successful. Yeah, yeah. 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 Uh, still very successful. Yeah, absolutely. From, from the uh, same area, actually. Maria, thank you for being here today. Tell everybody where they can find you. Yep. Um, thank you guys so much for having me. Sure. Um, I am online. Um, I have a website, mariakonnikova.com, that I almost never update, but it exists. Um, I'm on Twitter as mkonnikova, and I'm on Instagram as girl named Maria, but girl doesn't have an I because somebody already took that handle by the time I got on Instagram. So it's just GRL named Maria. And one day I will convince that person to surrender the Instagram handle girl named Maria with an I to me. Have you reached out to him yet? I mean, we can strong. No, I haven't. Him. Yeah, but we, I should. We yeah. can, look, we can strong arm him. Yeah. And if you're going to do right, that, all right, let's strong do it. arm the people from Amazon <laughs> because they've got you down as a two time New York bestseller. Yeah. So yeah. I, to have them change it to three. Yeah. You don't, you want a three Pete, right? Yes. You, yes. You don't want to be a twosie. Like, look, a lot of people have won back to back. Yeah. Three in three a row. Is, yeah. Yeah. Three That's is there's no doubt. There, you've done it. Back you've done to, it. Back to back <laughs> is like the Spurs. Three yeah, Lakers, the Lakers and Kobe. Bulls. Yeah, Lakers absolutely. and Bulls, right? Absolutely. <laughs> uh, thank you for being here, Maria. For D'Anthony, D'Anthony Holloway, I am Ross Patterson. This is the Drinking Bros. Good night, everyone.